Hey guys, what's up? It's Rob Dotson here, and today I'm going to talk to you about Require.js and embracing the awesomeness of asynchronous JavaScript modules. Um, Require.js is a technology that we've been using a lot at GE lately, and um, it seems to be gaining a lot of popularity all over the place. And even though it's been around for a while, not everyone has you know fully integrated it into their workflow. It can be really confusing um, transitioning over to working with asynchronous modules. And so I wanted to put together this talk. Uh, originally, I put it together to help out my teammates at GE. Um, but I wanted to release it, open source the slides and everything, so hopefully it can help out other people out there uh, in the great wide world of the internet. Um, because it can be a bit of a confusing topic, but it's not it's not so grisly once you kind of get your feet wet. Um, and speaking of getting your feet wet, why don't we just get started? Let's hop right to it. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of brief history because uh, I think it's really interesting to know the lineage of all of this technology and how we got here. Uh, I'm sure you are used to working with script tags. Uh, script tags been around for ever, maybe, <laughs> you know, like since day one of the internet. Uh, and so when you're working with script tags, uh, you can, you know, drop in your libraries, like, hey, I need jQuery, underscore, etc. It's all very familiar. Uh, but there's some problems with working with script tags. Script tags tend to pollute the global scope. Um, as you are working, you know, uh, you've just kind of got this, like, global soup. Of, of variables and things kind of floating around inside the browser and as you're dropping script tags on the page if they are creating more variables they are creating a bunch of objects they can start to collide uh, the other reason script tags can be a little tough is that sometimes they have a dependency order that needs to be respected uh, backbone JS requires that underscore JS be loaded before it. That's an actual dependency of backbone. It's on the underscore. So uh, you have to make sure that in your document that you're always loading underscore before you're loading backbone JS. Uh, likewise, if you are working with jQuery and you've got jQuery plugins, you got to make sure that jQuery and those plugins get loaded. Um, you have to make sure that jQuery gets loaded before those plugins, otherwise things can go all haywire. And, you know, if you've just got four items like this little script list, it's not a big deal, but once you have like 20 items, like 20 script tags on the page, this can become a real pain in the ass to manage. So, some very smart people came up with this thing called CommonJS. CommonJS has been around since around 2009, 2010. Uh, it's basically the de facto standard for JS on the server, and uh, I'm including a link to the specification for CommonJS. CommonJS is awesome. It's a very elegant solution to taking your JavaScript and packaging it up into modules that have uh, contained scope. Like the scope is local to the module, so you're not creating a whole bunch of global stuff all the time like you are in the browser. Uh, and then it also defines a mechanism for modules to depend on and require and like import other modules. So it's it's a wonderful specification, it's a wonderful idea, and if you've ever worked with Node.js, you'll know that uh, it's it's awesome to work with, super easy. Uh, but there's some problems with Common JS that some folks uh, had, and mainly it's because Common JS works really well on the server because uh, all the files on the server are local to one another. They all just live on the server. Um, whereas in the browser, the files are not all on the local file system. You have to go make asynchronous requests to go get those files. You know, you have to make an async request to load jQuery off of some server, to load uh, high charts or something like that, D3 off of some server. Uh, as a result, uh, as an offshoot of common JS, you have this thing called AMD, which stands for Asynchronous Module Definition. Uh, and AMD uh, takes a lot of uh, what's already in CommonJS, and it just adds some additional functionality to uh, help support some of the uh, workflows that are really common in the browser around asynchronous file loading and things like that. 
Uh, there are script loaders like require.js and curl.js, and I believe head.js implements AMD. I could be wrong, but I think it does. Uh, require.js is probably one of the best known, if not the best known, AMD script loader. Um, and I'm including a link to the AMD specification that you can check out. Uh, it's hosted on GitHub. It's a really short read. Don't be intimidated when I say uh, I'm including the link to a spec. Uh, I know if you've ever looked at like W3C type specs, they're like really long and poorly written and, and not fun to read at all. The AMD spec and, and the CommonJS spec are extremely short. They're like each a page or so, and you can read them really quickly. They're they're written in a way that, that is very easy to understand. Um, but anyway, AMD is this sort of, just think of it, you know, to wrap up this whole history section, just think of AMD as this sort of offshoot of common JS that has a little bit of extra magic special sauce in it to facilitate uh, asynchronous file loading in the browser, making that a little bit easier. And in a nutshell, this is what the API for AMD looks like. Um, you have a define function, which is how you define your modules, and then you have an optional ID, you have optional dependencies, and then you have a factory function that gets run, and whatever it returns is, is what your module, uh, it's, it's the exported value of your module. So I'm going to walk through each one of these individually so we can kind of get a deeper understanding of, of what they all uh, do. Uh, starting with ID. Uh, your ID is a unique identifier for your module, which, uh, as I can tell, is basically just a path, and you're just telling uh, RequireJS where to find that module. RequireJS discourages the use of module IDs. That's because if you know you if you need to change this module ID, you know, say you move your module to a different location in your project. You need to go back and you need to change this module ID by hand. That can become a real pain and a real nightmare. And so RequireJS says, hey, look, when you're developing, don't worry about putting an ID in there. And later on, when you use uh, the optimization tool that comes with RequireJS called RJS, later on when you use the optimization tool, I'm going to take care of putting those IDs in for you. So you know what? Just don't even worry about these things. Uh, I want you to know that they exist. It's 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 important for for you know you to know that these things exist and that you might bump into a named module at some point. But if you're working with required JS, then you can just ignore this this for now. Just know that it exists. Um, dependencies. So you can define an optional list of dependencies in an array. And RequireJS will go out and inject all those dependencies into your module. And that will look something like this. In this case, you've said, hey, I depend on jQuery. I depend on D3. And RequireJS is going to go out and find jQuery. It's going to find D3. And it's going to pass them to this function, this callback function. And then inside of your module, you can use jQuery, and you can use D3, and you can go crazy. If you're asking how does it know where jQuery and D3 are, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain how it does all that magic later. But for now, um, just put that question aside for a moment and just know that you can define your dependencies and require just is just gonna go find them and load them on in. Uh, if you want to know like what's happening behind the scenes though, like how does it actually load these things in? Uh, so not, not necessarily how does it find them, but just like how does it make them show up on the page. Uh, when RequireJS sees that you're asking for jQuery or D3 or some other module, um, it goes out and it turns that, sorry my slides are blowing up, it turns that into this, uh, a bunch of script tags in the head of the document. So basically, you say, hey, require JS. I require jQuery and D3 and, and some widget uh, and like app or whatever, like all these files. Uh, require JS goes and it looks at all those files. And then it looks to see if any of those files have dependencies. And if it does, it goes and it grabs all those dependencies and it goes to see if they have dependencies and so on and so on. And it puts 
all of those dependencies into script blocks, it tosses them into the head of your document, it waits for them all to load, and then it starts running these uh, these module callback functions. And so you get this sort of like nice life cycle to like going and like finding the dependencies, putting them all on the page, and then kicking everything off. So behind the scenes, that's what's going on. That's that's sort of the magic that happens with dependencies. Uh, finally, there's a factory function, and this is uh, a required property. Uh, you need to specify a factory function, and it's called once per module. If the factory function returns anything, then that object should be assigned as the exported value. So as an example, um, here I'm defining a module. And uh, it returns an object. That's like the first thing that it does. And so anything inside of this object later on, like let's say this, let's say this guy is called uh, <clears throat> foo.js, you know, and uh, he, you know, maybe has a property on his object name is equal to foo. So later on, when someone requires the foo module, they're going to get this object, and if they, they alert the name or they, they log the name property of that object, they should see something uh, that looks like this, something that says foo. So uh, I emphasized up here the word if. If the factory r function returns anything, then that object should be the exported value. Um, you don't necessarily have to return anything for your module. And for like jQuery plugins, for instance, they don't return anything at all. They just load in jQuery, and then they just add a new function to the jQuery object that was loaded in. And there is no return value whatsoever. So uh, not everything is going to return a value. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, let's see, things you can do with the factory function. So, you can return an object, and we just went over that. Straightforward enough, so uh, return an object, uh, the name property is Rob, say hello is a, is a method of the uh, person object that we've created right here, and then later on in your application you can say, hey, I need that person object, and once it loads in, it'll run the callback, and then you can say, person, say hello, and it will alert, hi, my name is Rob. Straightforward, right? Uh, another thing you can do is you can return a function. You don't have to return an object literal. You can just return a function, because functions in JavaScript, they're first-class citizens. They are objects as well, and so you can pass them around. And so in this case, we have defined a module called sum dot js which returns a function which just takes two numbers and it alerts the sum of those two numbers and then later on in calculator js we say hey i depend on sum so the sum function gets loaded whoa sorry about that sum function gets loaded and then we call sum and we pass in two and two and it spits out four and this is useful if you want to make like little utility functions that you can just like pull into uh, your modules. But another reason why it's very useful to return a function is it means that you can return constructors. So if you're very used to class-based languages, if you're coming to JavaScript from Java or uh, like C Sharp or Ruby or something like that, Python, whatever. Uh, maybe the dreaded flash and action script. Um, <laughs> uh, if you're coming over from any of these class-based languages and you're used to working with uh, constructors, then you can just define a constructor function and return that a reference to that function. And then elsewhere in your app, you can require that function. You can say, hey, Rob equals new person, so you can use the new keyword, and then you can tell uh, Rob to say hello. So again, if you're more comfortable organizing your application in this way, 
if you're more comfortable kind of like framing your thinking around constructors and, and more OO type uh, organizations, then you can use this approach and have Require.js basically just act as your dependency injection library, which can be very handy. All right, uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this slide because it's a little uh, complex, but if, you know, kind of piggybacking off of that last slide a bit, there's a lot of um, sort of class, like classical language constructs that you can recreate using uh, modules in, in Require.js and AMD. Uh, for instance, you could create private variables and private functions if you would like to, uh, because really we're, we're talking about working with closures here. This, the, the factory function that we've been talking about is it, it basically just creates a closure. Uh, and so uh, here it's returning an object, and that object has like some methods, and they call functions, but those functions are all defined up here but only the stuff down here is what is getting returned. So all this stuff up here, although these guys can access it, they can call this getter or whatever, that getter is not really exposed to the client and to the outside world. So if you want to make private stuff, you can. Um, it's totally up to you. Uh, another useful thing that you can do with the factory function is you can very easily make jQuery plugins. Um, you just define jQuery and you'll get the little dollar sign passed in and then you just start tacking stuff on to the jQuery prototype. Uh, so this is a really quick and easy way to make jQuery plugin, make sure that um, jQuery is loaded properly. Uh, I know that I said that the factory function is required. It's actually not technically required. You can skip it and just pass in an object. So uh, and it's kind of just to, like save you from writing a bunch of like boilerplate. Like if you have a function that's just going to return an object, like you don't need it to do any sort of setup work or anything, you can just go ahead and like pass an object to define, and uh, it will treat that as as the the value for your module. And so this is good for like if you have like a configuration object or just some object full of like metadata or something, you know, just a whole bunch of constants or whatever. Stuff that you just like isn't gonna change. You just know that your app needs it. Um, you can go ahead and you can do it this way and save yourself a little bit of time. Uh, one more thing that I didn't really touch on, there is another part to the uh, to the AMD specification, and that's this require function. Uh, there are cool, like tricky things that you can do to work with uh, the require function inside of modules, um, and you can you can look that up on the require.js website under uh, like common I think it's called like common JS syntax or something like that. Uh, it's totally a cool and interesting way to work. Typically, I don't work with it that way though. I usually just use define and all the stuff that define uh, uh, exposes. Um, but what I do use require for is oftentimes in my index file, like I'm going to kick off an application or something, and I'll require whatever is like the main module and then kick off my app. So it might be like, hey, uh, I need like app, make sure like app is loaded and then do stuff with app. Um, You'll sometimes need to set up configuration before you do anything like this, and I'll show examples of like how to set up your configuration for require.js. Uh, but uh, but yeah, like there is this require function. Dig into it a little bit. Um, uh, but typically, I use I use define all over the place, and then I just use require to like in my index file to like kick things off. Uh, let's talk about some gotchas. Because there are a few gotchas, um, and it's important to know about gotchas. So dependency order matters. Uh, the stuff that you list in this array when you're listing out your dependencies needs to match what ends up over here in the assignment uh, for the uh, factory function. So in this case, we've required jQuery and some jQuery plugin. 
Now jQuery exports a value, so we put a dollar sign here. But some jQuery plugin does not export a value, so we don't need to put anything there. Uh, we could put undefined, but that's just kind of unnecessary, so we just do it this way, and we are... my slides work... we're doing good. Now, what about this situation where you put some jQuery plugin first in the array, and then you put jQuery in? Um, Require.js is going to take these two, and it's going to load them in the right order. Uh, the problem is that your function assignment is going to be all out of whack, because that dollar sign is going to refer to some jQuery plugin, and then you don't really have anything explicitly referring to jQuery. So when you try and do something with the dollar sign, it's going to explode, because really what you've got, since it's a one-to-one -one match, what you've really got is this. And so undefined would match some jQuery plugin, dollar sign would match jQuery. Um, so watch out for this kind of thing. It's gonna bite you occasionally. Just make sure that um, that you get the order right. So the things that the easiest way to do it is the things that you know export a value like jQuery or Backbone or whatever. Put those in the beginning of the array, and then all the stuff that's gonna just like be a jQuery plugin or not export a value. Put those towards the end of the array, and you don't have to write out a bunch of undefined. So you just you just they'll just be undefined and you'll be cool um another thing that i see a lot of people doing is mixing asynchronous and synchronous code this can be like really confusing especially if you're taking a project that uh was written with a bunch of script tags and now you're trying to get require.js to start working in like parts of it but you haven't gone like whole hog amd yet you're you're, you're kind of like piecemeal doing it. Um, I see people do this all the time where they, they'll say, okay, I require a jQuery and some widget and high charts and, um, and do something interesting with jQuery and then uh, I'm going to load some high charts plugin and then I'm going to do something interesting with that widget that I loaded. But this is like totally broken. Um, this block right here is fine. You know, and uh, if we wait for jQuery to to load in or whatever, we can start doing stuff with jQuery. If we wait for widget to load in, we can start doing stuff with widget. Uh, but what what's actually happening is as the browser sort of like traverses its way through the document, it hits this, and it says, "Oh, you want jQuery and widget and all this other stuff? I'm gonna go load those things. I'll be back in a second. And it makes these asynchronous requests for all of these libraries. Meanwhile, it just the browser just keeps on going down the document and parsing stuff. So then it hits this line where you ask for some high charts plugin, and it's like, oh, cool! I'm gonna load that right now because you're in a script tag, so you're gonna get loaded synchronously. So it's gonna load some high charts plugin, but high charts maybe hasn't hasn't you know this this require statement maybe hasn't returned yet so high charts might not even be on the document so at that point this could very potentially blow up the page um and then the browser you know it keeps on going and it sees this script block and it's like widget do something well widget doesn't exist in this scope widget exists in in this scope and not only that but you still don't know if widget has loaded yet. So to, to remedy this, it's probably better to take your widget stuff and put it up here, and then to take some high charts plugin, oops, take some high, some high charts plugin and just make that into like another AMD module or something like that. So keep in mind, just don't mix async and synchronous code. Uh, you shims, uh, I'll talk about shims a little later, but you shims or define your own AMD modules instead. Try to avoid script tags. Once you start using require.js, try to avoid script tags as much as possible. Um, another thing to watch out for are circular dependencies. So if module A depends on module B, and then module B depends on module A, and one of them tries to load the other one, that's going to be a huge problem. Like a, a rip in the time-space continuum is going to open up, uh, 
And what's actually going to happen is, which, like, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember, which, whichever one uh, loads first is going to get a value for its dependency. So if module A loads first, then it's going to actually get a value from module B. Uh, but when module B loads, its value from module A is going to be undefined. And so really, like, you're in a situation where your modules are broken, you can't work with them. Uh, there is a workaround, and I have included a link to the workaround, but you should try to avoid these situations. And if you are like a badass, and you know exactly what's going on, like, like exactly why you have a circular dependency, and you're like, it's got to be this way, then go check out that workaround. If you've just kind of like stumbled into a situation where you have a circular dependency, you weren't planning on it, um, then it's probably best, almost certainly best, to back up and refactor your code so you don't have these circular dependencies, because they're going to be kind of weird to work with, and you should try to avoid this if you can. Okay, configuration. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, you know, if you're looking at the examples, I'm just like requiring jQuery, I'm requiring high charts, I'm doing whatever, uh, but it's like, well, how does, how does require.js know where to find this stuff? So I'm going to talk through the the three most important configuration properties that I I deal with, um, and then show you a few examples for how you can use them uh, for like single page and multi page apps. So you've got uh, base URL, which tells Require.js where to find your modules. Um, let's say that you have a folder structure that's like app, assets, JS. And then you've got subfolders. Uh, you got one, well, here, maybe we won't call this app. <laughs> so we'll call this www. There we go. So you have a subfolder for app and subfolder for vendor. Um, and then in a configuration file, you say, hey, require.js, uh, your base URL is slash assets slash JS. And what that tells require.js is, Anytime I start asking for app slash main or vendor slash bootstrap, I want you to start here at this base URL and load these modules relative to that. So go for go to assets, go to JS, and then here's app.main and vendor bootstrap. Uh, if you are like me and you are a lazy developer, you don't really like typing vendor bootstrap over and over and over again. So you can shortcut your frequently used paths by using the paths property. Uh, so that would look like this. So still got that base URL to assets.js, but then we take the paths property and we uh, shorten vendor slash bootstrap to just bootstrap. So that says, hey, anytime a module lists bootstrap as a dependency, look for it in assets.js slash vendor bootstrap. Easy enough, yep, and then that'll, that'll look like that. Uh, shimming. Shimming is the third property I want to talk about. It's really important, it's really interesting, and it can be a little tricky. But basically it lets you take libraries that are not written uh, as AMD modules, and it lets you load them in the correct order. Uh, so for instance, uh, high stock, which is a variant of high charts, requires jQuery, um, and it is itself not written as an AMD module, so we shim it. We put it in this little shim directory, directive or whatever, and we define a path to it so that requires.js knows where to find it, and then we say, hey, when someone asks for this, uh, since it's shimmed, Make sure that jQuery gets loaded first, and then try to load high stock onto the page. And this is really important. Uh, it's less of an issue when you're when you just have something like this, where it's like high stock has one dependency, and it's like okay, whatever. It's uh, much more important when you have uh, shim libraries that depend on other shim libraries. As an example, I'd cite like jQuery, or sorry, like Backbone and underscore. So Backbone is not an AMD library, Underscore is not an AMD library, and 
for backbone to load property, like for you to be able to require backbone, means that uh, that underscore needs to be loaded on the page first. And so what you would do is you would shim both of those libraries to make sure, so require.js will make sure that underscore gets loaded on the page first and then backbone gets loaded. Because backbone doesn't have any definition of its dependencies inside the file itself. You know, it never says define and then with like an array of dependencies. So you've got to shim things like that and it's very important when you have uh, one shim library depending on another shim library because it, it has no other way of, of expressing its dependencies. Uh, yep. So, single page application, like how do you load this configuration file into your app? If you're working on a single page application, uh, this is probably what your configuration file is going to look like. This is based off of the one I've been showing so far. And then you can use this, uh, you can use this script tag to load in require.js, right? And then there's this thing called data main, and it is this little attribute that tells require.js, all right, once, once require.js is loaded, l then immediately load this file. And typically, you make this either, this is going to be like the, the main file for your app or whatever. I mean, it's probably always going to be a configuration file of sorts. And so what I'll do is I'll say, hey, I want it to be this config file. And there's, there's this additional property called depths or depends. And I say this file depends on um, app slash main. And so what it's going to do is it's going to set up my base URL and my paths and my shims and everything. And then it's going to run my main file. Uh, so this way, um, this way you can, uh, you can have all your configuration stuff loaded in and then you can like kick off your app. For a multi-page application, again, similar configuration file. I don't have that uh, dependency array, that depths array. Um, and my slides participate. There we go. And to load require.js in a multi-page application, I typically do something like this, where I have a I have a pair of like nested require blocks. So I have one that'll load in all my config stuff, and then I have another that will like kick off my app. And the reason why I do this is because require.js also has a build tool called rjs. rjs minifies and concatenates all of your JavaScript together. It's really important. You should definitely go check out the docs and, and read all about it. Um, but when you're multi working on a, a single page site, it's OK to just take all of your JavaScript and put it into one file and then load that file. If you're working on a multi-page site where you know there might be some JavaScript on the about page that just isn't on the contact page, so it doesn't make sense to load all of your JavaScript for the whole site if you're working on a multi-page site. So instead what I do is I, I have two nested require calls and when I do my concatenation, my minification, I take all the stuff that's like common to the entire site, like jQuery and Backbone and things like that, and I'll have this first require call load. Um, I'll take it. I'll take everything and, and minify it into the config file. So, uh, so I load. Basically, I'm loading the config file and jQuery and Backbone. I'm loading all that stuff that's common across the entire site, and then once it's loaded, then I load. You know page one or whatever. I load the uh, the JS that's specific to the page that I'm on at the moment. And that way I'm not like loading a bunch of stuff from the contact page into the about page unnecessarily. Uh, all right, so that's it for today. I hope this was informative. I hope I didn't commit too many egregious errors. Uh, check me out on Twitter. I'm going to put the slides up on GitHub. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Later.